are new um, to the conference, I'm Debbie Silverstein, and I'm the state director of SPAN Ohio. And I do want to ask, for how many people is this the first conference of SPAN Ohio that you've attended? Wow, want to give them a warm welcome. We are so excited to have you here with us. And one of the things that keeps an organization vibrant and meaningful is when we constantly have um, people that come into the organization and share their ideas and information and, and, that, and that keeps us young, that keeps us vibrant, that keeps us active, and that keeps us on target. So thank you very much. How many of you have been to all 13 conferences? This is the 13th. Anyone else? Um, okay, Alice, and I'm sure Van and Barb out in the hall, and, uh, and one of our tardy members who's on his way um, has been here. But those people really deserve a round of applause too because that's perseverance. Because I, I can't even claim that. I came into the organization about 2008, and um, you know, it's been, um, it captured me. And this is my issue. And part of that is because of background. I bargained health care benefits for our union, and I know how difficult that was. And then the difficulty we had in getting care for my brother, who had no insurance, even though he was employed most of his adult life, but he had some pretty serious conditions and he just there was just no way to get the help he truly needed you know again they would stabilize or do the minimum so that he could go on his merry way and that's all they were required to do no one was going to do the other stuff for freight so it was a big issue to me and that's what got me going um i would like to also welcome today uh, michelle mahan a registered nurse from um, national N nurses united michelle where are you Okay, Michelle is, Michelle is going to be conducting um, a workshop on organizing around health care issues. National Nurses United is the largest um, union representing rep uh, registered nurses in the country. And if anyone has experience organizing around health care issues, it is National Nurses United. Michelle is an organizer with them. She has... Um, worked um, in nursing capacities for um, various institutions, including the Cleveland Clinic. Where else, Michelle? Uh, too many to name. <laughs> <laughs> too many to name. Okay. And, um, and so we're very, very thankful that she's bringing her expertise um, to us today. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Jeffrey Sussman. The, he's a physician and um, the dean of the medical school at Northeast Ohio Medical University, formerly known as NeoUCOM, now known as NeoMed. And he's going to be talking to us about uh, some of the programs that they're conducting there and give us a little bit of insight into how, um, you know, the primary care crisis can be alleviated and what we can do through workforce initiatives to improve the health of our communities. Um, Alice Farina and Don Rucknagel, where are you? Okay, Alice and Don are both physicians, retired physicians. They're going to be presenting um, a presentation of the movie Fix It, Healthcare at the Tipping Point. Fix It um, came about when a business CEO got tired of the double digit increases in insurance premiums that he was receiving every year and said, Where is this money going? Because he knew it was not translating into increased coverage or improved coverage for his employees. And in fact, their coverage was deteriorating. So he decided to employ best business practices in investigating the issue and did his investigation, came up with his conclusions, hired a director and a film crew, and the movie documentary Fix It was the result of that. Fix It is the first part um, of a trilogy. The second one that's coming out is going to be on Big Pharma and the third one on Big Hospitals. Um, so it should prove to be very interesting. And uh, the man that did it, the business CEO, he gives away, he hasn't copyrighted anything. You can go to their website and you can download the, the film for free. He says this is an educational endeavor, not a business endeavor. He says it makes it too complicated to collect fees from you. He says kind of like going to the doctor, but they do it anyways. Um, <laughs> 
and stuff. He says, I would rather that it just get out and get used and that. So we will be having a showing. People that attend will get their free copy of Fix It. And um, there will be some discussion on how that can be best utilized. Okay, I would, um, yes, uh, yeah, I'd like to direct your attention to the materials in your folder. First thing is we want to say thank you to our sponsors. This is the, um, on the left hand side. Um, these organizations have donated some funds to help um, cover the cost of this conference because this is um, kind of a, an expensive proposition um, to carry on and it helps, this allows us to keep um, doing this and to um, you know, have this in a, a lovely venue such as this. So thank you very much to them. Okay, behind that, you will have a five-year strategy list. Last year at the conference, we did some goal setting, and we're going to do that again this year. But one of the things is we knew we needed to have a strategy plan. We needed to have it mapped out. And so we did put together that strategy plan. Um, despite the fact that we have a bill in the legislature that's been introduced, and that Senate Bill 137 introduced by Senator Mike Skindle and Senator Charlita Tavares, the legislature hasn't taken a serious look at it. So if we really want to make some waves and we want to get this job done, we're going to have to rely on ourselves and not someone else to do it, and that means going to the ballot. So we set 2020 as our campaign date for going to the ballot, and you'll be happy to know Oregon is probably going to go to the ballot that same year, and I think Washington State as well. So we're going to have some co um, company in drawing insurance company ire and funds against us so we can dilute that a little bit. But right now, we are in an intensive period of base building, and it looks like it's paying off because it's so great to see you know, all these faces out there. Um, well, then we'll be entering into the signature gathering campaign and then we'll be into the actual campaign for the ballot initiative. So I wanted you to know we have done this, we've thought you know, through this, we've determined our strategy, we know where we're going, but at the end of the day when we finish up we're going to have some goal setting. What I'm going to be asking you to do is to tell us what goals do we need to set for this calendar year so that we can maintain our schedule on the strategy timeline and we can achieve our goal overall. Okay. The next thing is behind and under with um, program and agenda, SPAN realized that we needed to make some internal adjustments. Uh, so we devised um, a membership plan people can become members of SPAM. We never had membership or dues in the past, but we're going to offer that now for people that want to um, you know, make a contribution on a regular basis to be supporting a good cause and, and a wonderful organiza organization like us. So what you will get for that is the discount on registration starting next year um, for the conference, organizational voting privileges, and, and the knowledge that you're supporting a good cause there. Um, where's Marsha Hartman? Marsha, stand up. Marsha is the chairperson of the membership committee and she's at the table right out there. Okay, you have, some of you filled out membership forms on your way in, some of you have not, um, and you may want to, or you may want to take them home and mail them back in and stuff, but Marsha is here and if you want to become a member of SPAN, then um, you can see Marsha during the day sometimes. She'll be around all day and she'll be happy to take these. As well as Bill Davis. Okay, as, as well as Bill. Okay. Okay. The last thing in there that you're gonna see is um, a flyer that's called Healthcare is a Human Right Collaborative. And this is um, a collaboration that um, came partly out of the National Economic and Social Rights Initiative with four state-based groups working for healthcare justice. And we don't always say we're working for a single payer program, but rather we're working for a healthcare system that meets human rights standards because ours is far from it. It leaves a lot to be desired when you look at it from that standpoint. 
And those standards um, and principles are universality, equity, accountability, transparency, particip participation. I can tell you right now, our healthcare system is far from transparent, and there's very little equity that's involved. So, um, got a lot of work to do, guys. Our speaker today is from Nesri, and he is going to talk a little bit about this and about the collaborative, and then how we can use shared values, things that we all have in common. No matter what our backgrounds, we do have some things that stand out to us, you know, that are, are in common with one another. And what brings that to light for me was when I was in London one year, and it was the day after the London um, tube bombings, and I was going to the station, I was going to France to my sister's house, and the, the taxi driver that was taking me to the station was an Iraqi Kurd. And he was telling me that um, his car had been in the shop the day before, um, but he usually um, drove that area there where the bus was that had been bombed, and that was right around the corner of, from our hotel. And he said, if I had been out yesterday, if my taxi had been working, he says, I could have been killed. And so then he told me, you know, he had come from Iraq and he had been in one of Saddam's prisons, he and two of his friends, and his friends had been hung. And he was the next to be hung, but the Gulf War, the first Gulf War broke out and the soldiers went south to fight the Americans, so he escaped with his family and came to London. And I said, wow. I said, it sounds like you're meant for some, something big to do. And he says, well, what do you mean? I said, well, the higher power, I said, whatever we call our higher power, I said, has a plan for you. And he says, but I don't know what it is. And I said, well, I said, let's stop and think about you and me. I said, we're pretty different, aren't we? <laughs> totally different cultures. He says, yeah. I said, but what's the most important thing to us? He says, well, my family. I said, mine too. I said, your family, being able to love them, be loved by them, provide for them, care for them, freedom. He says, yes. And I said, well, those are basic to all people despite the differences. I said, differences just make us interesting to one another. I said, but those basic things that are so common are the most important to all of us. I said, and maybe we need to concentrate on those instead of what's different. He stopped the taxi, turned around to me and said, I think you're right. He says, and I will start today. And I said, good for you. And so with that, Ben is going to expand on our shared values and let us know how to use them because we are all leaders. All right, good morning. How's everyone doing? Good. My name is Ben Pomquist. As Debbie mentioned, I'm with the National Economic and Social Rights Initiative, NESRI for short. Um, and I also help coordinate the Healthcare as a Human Right Collaborative. I'm really excited to be here today. It's an honor and a privilege, so thank you for inviting me out. Um, I get to work with organizers like you all over the country who are organizing for the human right to healthcare, healthcare justice, and other issues um, all over the place. And I really love my job. I get to work with amazing people. But in practice, a lot of the time I spend is behind a computer screen. And so it's really great to be here in person. This is where this stuff happens, person to person. Um, I want to, I guess just starting out, just like want to take a moment to have everyone just sort of look around the room at each other and just take a moment to appreciate each other for coming out today. Um, I think you know, a lot of people traveled a long way to get here. A lot of people skipped other things that they could have been doing today. Um, some people have their own healthcare struggles and still made it out to join us. Um, so take a moment to appreciate each other for that. And take a moment to appreciate yourself for coming out. I think, you know, you're here today. Yeah. And you are part of this larger struggle, um, you know, really working with people for something you believe in. And I think that's a really beautiful thing, and it's a powerful thing. And I also want to appreciate just sort of the what's between us, the relationships, the bonds. And this is, I think, really what keeps us involved and where the real sort of the power and the efficacy and what we're doing is, is how we all work together and the human connection we feel with each other. Debbie just spoke really beautifully about, you know, that sort of our common humanity. And I think that's what really what this is all about. Yes, thank you. Um, so there's a lot of power in our relationships, and that's really what I want to speak to today, is sort of the power that we have together and how we can build 
continue to build power to win single payer and win, win healthcare justice. I'm going to be speaking in a little bit about three kinds of power that I want to suggest that we really need to think about building. People power, narrative power, and network power, which is the power we build with allies. Um, but before I do that, I want to just like stop for a moment to think about this moment we're in. I think it's a really sort of crazy time in the world. Um, you know, the last years have seen a lot of really movements just explode out of nowhere, you know, from Occupy, the Arab Spring, Black Lives Matter. And, um, you know, this year's presidential election has captured everybody's attention. Um, I don't know that anybody predicted either how well Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump would do. Um, it's certainly been interesting watching everything unfold. And, you know, this all happens in a global context, too, where, you know, there's terrorism, there's a huge migrant crisis all over the world. There's labor uprisings. There's a return to hardline nationalism. There's good things and bad things happening all over. And I think that, you know, some of this is really scary. I think that um, some of these movements, and they are movements, are really trying to tap into people's worst fears in order to divide people, in order to exclude people and oppress people. Um, but I think there's also a lot of really beautiful movements happen happening right now that are affirming our common humanity, that are affirming our dignity and putting out a vision for a better world. To me, my sense is that there's really a common cause behind all of these things, and that's that people are struggling. People are struggling to meet their fundamental needs, their need for healthcare, their need for decent housing, for clean water and food, for safety. And you know, all across this country, there's millions of people in poverty. There's millions of us, and I would count myself in this, who you know, are probably middle class, but are still feel really insecure, are worried about the future, and are still struggling to meet our basic needs. And so it's hard not to feel like the whole system's rigged, right? I mean. 99% of us really don't have true power over our own lives, much less power over the economic and social and political systems that shape our lives. So, you know, our struggle for single payer I see in this larger context. And so, yes, this is a struggle about our health and healthcare, but it's also a struggle about economic justice and social justice and racial justice. It's a struggle about our democracy and our future as a country. Um, and so, you know, I look around this room at you all, and I feel really hopeful, actually, that, you know, there, I think the seeds, the way that change happens is from people coming together to stand up for what they believe in and to do something about it. And that's what I see here today. I see folks who are coming together with each other, who are speaking out against injustices, who are rolling up their sleeves to do the hard work of what needs to happen, um, and people, some people who are building power. Every one of us is a part of something that's much bigger than ourselves, of course. Um, you know, we're connected to our friends and loved ones who inspire us to do us, this work. We're connected to communities and activists who've come before us, who we learn from, and to struggles for healthcare justice and economic and social justice all over the world. So um, to say a little bit more about myself and my work at Nesri, you're seeing some photos here with uh, some of the groups we work with, the Vermont Worker Center and others I'll to speak more about. Um, we are a social movement support organization, a human rights organization. And so we partner with grassroots groups all over the country to support campaigns around economic and social rights. Um, so what this means for me, which is fun, is that I get to learn from incredible organizing that's happening all over the place. And some, sometimes it's successful, sometimes there are pitfalls, you know, but there's a lot to be learned. Um, we work with groups like the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, which is an organization of farm workers in the tomato fields of South Florida. And these workers are working in extreme conditions but have managed to come together to build power and to organize in order to enforce their own rights in the farm fields. We also work with groups like um, the Dignity in Schools campaign, which is a national network of young people, mostly people of color and their parents, who are organizing in cities including Columbus and Toledo and Dayton to make sure that all people's right to an education 
is fulfilled. I work um, mostly in healthcare, and so I'm working largely with the members of the Healthcare as a Human Right Collaborative. So those are the Healthcare as a Human Right campaigns of Vermont, Maine, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. And then more loosely with Span Ohio and groups all over the country who are organizing for healthcare justice. Um, part of what I see through this is that, you know, our struggles or our, our struggle around healthcare really is part of these larger struggles, as I've been saying. Um, but also that I think our organizing around healthcare, we occupy a really important place in these larger struggles. Healthcare is an issue that matters to all of us, right? It's a universal need, it's a universal experience. And unfortunately, struggling with the healthcare system is nearly universal in this country as well. Just about every family and certainly every community has a story about somebody who's struggled to get the care they need, but you know, has faced obstacles, whether it's deductibles or whether it's been narrow networks or excluded care. Um, you know, nobody can provide health care on their own, of course. Not even libertarians, despite what they seem to think. <laughs> and we're all better off when we have health care and when everybody else has health care too. Right? When our neighbors, our coworkers, and everybody else has health care, all of us are better off. But as we know, and this is a story you know well, um, that's not the way things are working. We're in the midst of a healthcare crisis. So millions of people, even after the Affordable Care Act, remain uninsured. Healthcare costs keep going up. Deductibles are skyrocketing. Many thousands of people still die every year, tens of thousands actually, from preventable deaths. Entire groups of people, including women, immigrants, poor people, people of color, people with mental health problems and addiction, Entire groups of people are facing discrimination, inequity, inequities, and inadequate care. I'm not going to dwell on the problems, because you all know that well. <laughs> we need to talk about sort of what we're going to do about it. Um, but I do just want to say sort of that we are up against a big challenge, right? So we know that the insurance industry is hugely powerful and has a vested interest in stopping what we're trying to do. We also know that you know, there's the pharmaceutical industry, big hospital industry um, are often resistant. The media and the political system are to a large extent sort of controlled by you know, very wealthy and powerful money interests, corporations and private wealth. I think inertia is also a challenge that you know, we are trying to overcome. People are sort of used to the way things work, and even if they don't work that well, it's, people are familiar with it, and so we have a lot of education to do. Um, there's also challenges with our electoral system and lawmaking, just the fact of what it takes to pass you know, budget measures and big legislation in this country. And, and you know, there's a lot that we can do on the state level, and I think that's where the exciting organizing is happening here in Ohio and in other states, but there's, there are also limits to what states are allowed to do under federal law. And the other thing is it's not easy to organize, right? You guys all know this. It's hard work. Um, and so there are real challenges. And I think it's important to recognize, actually, that it's hard. This is hard work. And there are days when we all feel like we're beating our heads against the wall or where we're not getting anywhere. And, but that's okay, I think. And I think actually it's, I find it helpful to name that and to say, okay, it's not supposed to be easy, right? This is part of the process and this is part of the work and we're doing it together. And this is what needs to happen for us to get to where we need to be. So this was really, all this was driven home for me um, when I got involved with supporting the Healthcare as a Human Right campaign of Vermont. Um, you know, this, I got involved a few years ago, but folks started organizing back in 2008. And really before that, you know, single-payer activists in Vermont had for many years been doing a lot of great work to, to really legitimize single-payer and universal health care as, a, as a, what was needed in the state. But there just wasn't the political power to get it through. And so an interesting thing happened, which is there's a, there's a town called Barry, Vermont. that's a working-class town. Um, they had a workers' rights hotline. And workers were calling in with problems on the job, but it, you know, everybody who was calling in, it seemed, their problem at work was connected to problems with housing or problems with their kids' schools or problems with health care. And people realized we can't just focus on workplace issues in isolation. Everything's connected. And fundamentally, what we need to do is build power to change a situation. And so people did a lot of study together, and they, they came together at the newly formed Vermont Worker Center to figure out what they were going to do about it. 
And they realized that healthcare was an issue that was, again, broadly and deeply felt, right? It was something that everybody had some connection to and felt really deeply passionate about. And so people decided to launch the Healthcare is a Human Right campaign. And what they did through the campaign was started building people power and narrative power and network power. So they started organizing folks all over the state, thousands and thousands of their neighbors, um, who were directly experiencing the healthcare crisis and also you know, what I call intersecting crises, crises like poverty and racism and xenophobia that are make for whole groups of people are making the healthcare crisis worse. And so they organized people who were directly experiencing these things and engaging and activating people who had been totally checked out of politics before, people who had not been politically involved, had not been voting. And what they found was that there were lots of people who had these personal stories, but nobody was listening to them, and they felt hopeless. There was nothing that people could do about it. But suddenly, this campaign gave people a way to actually take action, come together with others in common cause, and mobilize. And so they had to, you know, there's challenges that come with suddenly bringing in new people with different backgrounds into a campaign, but they did a lot of political, uh, political education and leadership development together in order to build unity, a common vision, and their human rights framework was a, a good tool for that. Um, they began to develop a really powerful narrative that made a moral case for why the state of Vermont had to follow through and provide universal health care. And they built network power, so they started organizing with unions, with the disability rights community, with immigrant rights organizations, to really build a united front that was aligned in common cause. So I think you all probably know the story. Um, back in 2011, this really, or 2010, this really took off. Um, they managed to get in the governor's election, make healthcare the central issue. And the Democratic candidates in what is mostly a Democratic state started in the primary arguing against each other about who supported universal health care more, which is a really exciting thing. Um, that materialized the very next year, 2011, in the passage of Act 48, which is the first legislation of its kind in the US that said, we, the state of Vermont, are going to provide health care as a publicly financed public good um, for all people. And it was a really incredible victory. And I think both in our healthcare movements and also more broadly for in movements for human dignity and justice. As we also know, it was a partial victory, right? So the big catch was that that bill did not include actual financing, tax financing, to make the system a reality. And there were some legal challenges that were peculiar to the time. So the Affordable Care Act had just passed. And so part of what happened was Washington, D.C. told Vermont, you have to wait six years before we'll grant you a waiver to go ahead and do this. And so that set up a challenge, right? Um, the Worker Center, I think the Healthcare is a Human Right campaign had done a great job engaging people, mobilizing people for those three years leading up to the passage of the bill. People had a huge celebration, but then you know, we didn't figure out how to keep people engaged at that point um, to keep up the pressure that we needed to, to to continue to push the legislature through to pass the financing. At the same time, you know, this, I think the initial passage of the bill surprised um, opponents, surprised the health insurance industry and others, but that, that lag time gave them a chance to regroup and they really dumped money into the state and set up these lobbying organizations that, you know, we see everywhere else that we're using, you know, pumped out this predictable language around, oh, you know, this is a tax raise, we can't afford this. Um, and that language got picked up directly by the governor and other politicians um, later. So, you know, fast forward to late uh, 2014, Governor Shumlin, who had been a supporter, withdrew his support and sort of the, the political uh, possibility in that moment really faded. So, where are we now? I mean. This is, I still think Act 48 and the whole mo campaign model that got us there was a really powerful thing. The Vermont's Healthcare is a Human Right campaign is still really active and I think we still, I'm still really hopeful about where things are gonna go. Um, but the reality is just in terms of the legislative possibilities right now that Vermont is not gonna pass financing this year or next year or the next. And so it's really now, it's a, we're looking all over the country for who's gonna make this happen, you know, so. It could be Ohio in 2020, and it could be Oregon and Washington and anywhere else.
So, um, you know, it's up to all of us now to figure out how to do this and to try to advance the ball. But how do we do that, right? How does change happen? I mean, I think we know it takes a lot of hard work. I think there's also a little bit of sort of mystery involved in terms of, you know, looking back at some of the great moments of social progress in American history, women's suffrage, the civil rights movement, the anti-poverty and worker legislation of the 1930s and 1960s, the Americans with Disabilities Act, most recently marriage equality. You know, all of these things have been preceded and made possible by tremendous organizing that people were doing for many, many years, often behind the scenes that wasn't very visible, and that's not often told in the histories we're here. But you know what that's like. Um, but the other thing that happens is, you know, these tipping points come sort of unpredictably, and we don't know when our healthcare tipping point is gonna come. And so, you know, it's been really interesting to watch Occupy Wall Street and Black Lives Matter and the Arab Spring. I mean, these movements have really caught fire um, and you know, what was it about sort of one man in Tunisia setting himself on fire, or one woman in Cairo calling people out to Tahrir Square? Or what was it about you know, yet another death of a black man at the hands of the police that you know, led the people of Ferguson, Missouri to rise up? I don't think we know the answers to all that, but we do know that in order to prepare ourselves, like in order to uh, sort of till the soil and create fertile ground for those moments in order to prepare ourselves to be able to take advantage, we have to organize and build power, right? So, so I wanna talk about power um, and what the power I think it's gonna take for us to win. I looked up this definition. Um, power is the ability to do or act, the capability of doing or accomplishing something. As I said before, you know, we, we really don't have true power over our own lives, um, given the sort of political and economic realities of things. We don't have the ability to get the healthcare we need all the time. We don't have the ability to live to our fullest, healthiest potential. Because our fundamental needs, including healthcare and housing and good work and other things, are not met. So we, one of the things we talk about is that um, government really has an obligation to uphold our needs, right? That's why it's there. But we need to hold it accountable. And in order to do that, we need to have power. So the state of Ohio has an obligation to make sure that everybody is healthcare, an obligation we know it's not following through on. Um, but we have to build the power to hold it accountable. So I mentioned before these three kinds of power that I want to suggest today, these are three really fundamental forms of power that we need to be thinking about. They're not the only kinds of power, like yes, we're going to need electoral power and various other things. Um, but I think these are really foundational for, for how the process of, of how we're going to get to the point where we actually have the power to push the legislation we need and to win the, really the political and cultural shifts that are going to have to happen. Um, you know, the, there's just so much opposition to what we're trying to do. We're talking about big, big dollar amounts. There are going to be big losers in, the, you know, in insurance companies. And so we're really going to need to change things to make it happen. So the first form of power, people power, you know, we know. This is base building, right? So this is the work you're doing. Um, I do think it's really important to organize people in directly impacted communities. You know? So these are um, people who have their own health care crises, um, who feel very, or people who you know, have family members who have had health care crises, who feel very <laughs> passionate and vested. Right? These are people who are going to stick with us in the long haul. And these are also whole communities who have, because of poverty, because of racism, because of sexism, um, you know, are experiencing acute healthcare crises that are unique to their communities. Um, it's, you know, I think Black Lives Matter and the fight for 15 right now are arguably the sort of most dynamic and powerful movements going on in the U.S. And they're winning real changes, right? They're winning uh, living wage legislation and they're really shifting the conversation around policing. And I think that you know, the, the real power of those movements is that the people leading them, the people driving them, are low-wage workers and are young black folks who are directly impacted by these crises. And so that's where their power comes from. Um, 
besides just base building, we need to do what you know, Span Ohio and other organizations are also doing, right? Which is building what I call permanent organizations. So this is like the organizations, the structures, the institutions, the ways of communication, the things we need in order to work together for change. And that, I've, one of the things I've learned actually looking at some of the lessons from our other campaigns is that part of what's missing is uh, we, don't, we need more of a capacity to govern too. And we actually need to train leaders who can, like when we actually start to win power, who can step in and help run things. And the, you know, the, our organizations are a way that we can do that. Um, and we also have to develop, you know, part of how we build people power as well is doing political education together, learning together, coming together like this, and really intentionally helping to support each other's leadership development. That's where our power comes from. Um, healthcare, as I mentioned, is both very broadly and deeply felt. There's a lot of power in that. And so, you know, it gives us a chance to really connect with people who are uninsured, connect with people who are underinsured, connect with people who have had to haggle with their insurance company or have had to forego care. Um, and, you know, people are struggling and angry about it. And so if we can connect to them around their personal experiences, that really opens up opportunities for us to bring new people into the movement. And that's what we need, right? We need more folks who are leading with us. Um, what, I want to share a quick example. So one of the groups I work with is Put People First Pennsylvania. They're a group of you know, regular folks around the state of Pennsylvania. Um, and they, I think, are, they are running this healthcare as a human right campaign. Their big picture goal is to win universal healthcare. Um, but they're doing it, I think, in a really strategic way of identifying sort of smaller targeted issues that are emerging from communities from their base that are really things that they can organize and move in a more meaningful and more immediate way. Um, and so, you know, it's always important, I think, for us to ask, you know, who, uh, our movement needs to look like the communities that are affected by the healthcare crisis, and so who's missing from our midst? Who do we need to organize? And so, Put People First has been really intentional about organizing in rural communities and urban communities, white communities and black communities, immigrant communities and native-born communities. Um, and so they've developed a really diverse base and from their base and from other people they're talking to when they're going out and surveying and tabling, a couple uh, clear needs have emerged. One is that across the board, and I'm sure this is something a lot of you have experienced, people are really struggling still with the cost of healthcare, right? Mm -hmm. That premiums, and deductibles and other costs are really a big factor in our lives. Um, and so they're organizing to call on the Pennsylvania Insurance Department to hold public hearings to, uh, when they go through the process of approving uh, insurance rate hikes within the state. So I'm not sure about Ohio. Some states already have public hearings, but they're often just sort of tokenistic. Um, but in Pennsylvania, there's not even a public hearing. There's no way for people who are impacted by hikes to their insurance rates to be able to say anything about it. All that happens is the insurance companies put in their requests, you know, I want to jack up the insurance rates by 50%, and then the state makes a decision. So people are organizing to call on the state to um, hold public hearings. And this is both a policy tactic, right, to try to actually get the have more of a say in sort of how rate hearings are impacting people's lives. But it's also a base building tactic, right? This is a way that this is something that people are very immediately experiencing. It's, it's a way to connect people, bring them into the organization, and build people's leadership and commitment. The, um, I'm going to move on to narrative power, the next form of power I want to talk about. Um, healthcare is, of course, a moral issue, right? It is denying care to human beings is just morally wrong. We know that. And so our cause is a moral cause, and I think that gives us a lot of power. I think it, there's a real opportunity for us to connect through the language of values, common values. So that, you know, Debbie was talking about this, but values like caring and protection and nurturing and dignity, right? These are things that everybody cares about, whatever their political affiliation. And this gives us a chance to connect with people from many, many different backgrounds. We 
um, in the way we use human rights, um, I think it's pretty different from a lot of sort of uh, prominent human rights organizations like the Amnesty Internationals of the world. Um, we talk about human, we define human rights in, rights in terms of human needs, right? So we have needs for healthcare, for housing, for other things. Our fundamental needs that are necessary to our human dignity, those are human rights. But our rights are not handed down to us on high. We, sure, we have tools like international laws that we can lean on, but at the end of the day, we have to claim our rights through struggles. That's how we win our rights. And we, we are not passive recipients of rights. We are the holders of rights and the agents of change. We also talk about rights as being based on values, right? So our values help us articulate a vision that we have for the world. And they helped us connect one-on-one -on -one with people around mutually held values. And we also define our rights in terms of principles, right? So our principles, and I'll talk about these in a sec, um, having principles helps us give us a moral compass to help us stay on track with what we're really trying to do. And it helps us articulate our vision in a very specific way that we can actually look at legislation, look at policies, and assess them and say, is this, you know, is this policy universal? Is it equitable? And to very specifically um, critique the policy proposals and put forward the proposals that we need. So Debbie mentioned these principles. There's no one set of principles that, you know, again, are handed down on, on, from on high. But these five principles are what members of the Vermont Workers' Center democratically came up with as a collective. And they did a lot of study and discussion about their vision for the healthcare system and their vision for democracy and, and figured out together what principles would really illustrate that and, and help serve as tools for them. And so they settled on these five. Um, I want to highlight the first two especially. So universality is the idea that nobody is ever left out, right? It doesn't matter if you have a criminal record, it doesn't matter if you're undocumented, it doesn't matter if you're poor, there's no case in which anybody should be excluded from healthcare. The second is equity, right? So this recognizes that we all have different experiences, we all occupy different places in the world, and so we have somewhat different healthcare needs and we also have different resources. And so both healthcare delivery has to be equitable and also healthcare financing has to be equitable. And then these last principles, transparency, accountability, and participation, I think of as really the democratic principles. So these describe the way the system has to be designed, the way the system has to operate in order for it to meet our needs. So I think that the, um, we've found in practice across, you know, in farm worker organizing and the healthcare as a human right campaigns in uh, education organizing and other arenas that this sort of a framework has been really for powerful for a few reasons. The first is that it focuses on people, right? So it centers people in the center of all policies. So we're not talking about costs of uh, legislation and like, oh, should it be this much or this much? We're putting people's needs and rights at the center of things, and that is the foundation for what our policy uh, determinations have to be. It also highlights people who are most impacted, right? So that, yes, we have these universal needs, but some people's needs are more acute, and so we need to make sure that we're really prioritizing needs of those folks first. It also emphasizes our agency, right? So as I said, we're not victims, we're not consumers, we are holders of rights and we are agents of change. And another thing it does is it helps us reframe the debates. And so, you know, this really helps build our narrative power. Um, human rights help us illuminate the root causes of issues that fundamentally what we're talking about is a system that is not designed around people's needs, that the private insurance system is in, gives insurance companies a, uh, an interest that is in direct opposition to our fundamental rights. We are talking about um, the obligation on government that I mentioned. Um, it helps us reframe the issues from this place of individualism where we're individually responsible for achieving health care and our own health to this system of collective action and collective responsibility. Human rights help us reframe healthcare from being a commodity to being a public good. 
And they really help us sort of get beyond just single issue campaigns mm -hmm. to really connecting you know, our healthcare justice movement with larger struggles. And the third thing, of course, and this is what I'm going to say a little bit more about, is that I think human rights can help us build power. And so, you know, the, uh, a vision that is based around our values and our personal experiences really unites and inspires people. It can help in our campaigns move us, and this is why one of the reasons I think healthcare is such a powerful issue, move us from a defensive point where we're fighting against cutting this service or that um, to really putting out a proactive vision and proactive demands. Um, it can be an organizing tool, as I've mentioned, to really help engage and mobilize people and to build unity. Um, and I think that you know, a values-based vision, a values-based human rights vision can really expand what's politically possible. By putting out our, our positive vision, by connecting with people around common values, you know, we're no longer trying to say, okay, what can we do within what's currently politically possible? We're actually changing what's politically possible. So I know, um, I do hear pushback against the human rights framework. Um, if, you know, one of the typical things I hear is that, you know, oh, people don't respond to it, that, uh, you know, I say healthcare is a human right and somebody says, no, it's not. Um, I would say to that that, you know, the point is not to focus on any tagline or catchphrase. You don't even have to use the words human rights. Um, we often, when we're talking to people, we'll, you know, talk about economic and social justice and really actually do as much more listening than talking. Um, when we've surveyed people and asked people, you know, do you think anybody should be denied health care? 99% of people say no. I don't know who those 1% are, <laughs> but it's always around 99% across states. We've done this survey across states and people always uh, say the same thing. And so that's... Yeah, well, actually, I think I have heard about 1% of the population are sociopaths. So. <laughs> Yeah, they are ever represented as CEOs. Um, so, you know, people, that, that's a way for us to define what we mean. We don't have to use any specific phrase or language. We can use whatever language is working with people. But the point is that we are talking about sort of, you know, nobody should be denied access to care. It's that moral cause that I think is really important. Um, and so, you know, where does this lead us um, in terms of narrative power? I think we've actually won the policy argument. I mean, for decades, folks in the single payer movement have done an amazing job just sort of debunking myths and laying out the facts, doing comparative studies of other countries. And I think the ingredient that's lacking, though, is this mass mobilization. And so nobody knows exactly how we're going to get there. But I think that speaking to people's values and really activating people's emotions and organizing people most impacted is going to help us. So the third kind of power um, I want to mention is network power, right? So again, this is the power we build in alliance and partnership with other organizations. You know, can the single payer movement win single payer? I don't think so. Not on our own. Um, I think what it's going to take is real partnerships with other organizations and other movements that you know, we can't be just talking about healthcare financing, that we need to figure out how to really link up with broader movements for economic and social justice. You know, we need to figure out how to bring more people into mm -hmm. our movement who are directly impacted by all these crises and who have a stake in transforming the healthcare system. And we need to figure out how to build real strategic partnerships, not just sort of tactical alliances with other organizations where we say, oh, I'll show up at your thing if you show up at mine, or here's my fly, or you know, I'll take one of yours. But like, really, how do we build person-to-person -person relationships between organizations on the local level, on the state level, where we're you know, figuring out how is what we're really trying to do a part of what you're trying to do, and how is what you're doing a part of what we're doing, and how can we work together to help realize all of this? So what does this look like in practice? I mean, um, I just want to share a really quick anecdote. I'm probably running. How am I doing on time? I'm just going to share a quick anecdote. So that um, shortly before uh, the Vermont legislature passed Act 48, there was an attempt by some legislatures to try to cut 
people who were undocumented out of the bill. So the bill had been written as a totally universal bill, and there was an attempt by some legislators to say, oh, except if you're undocumented, you can't be a part of the healthcare system. Um, now, fortunately, the Healthcare is a Human Right campaign had done a lot, had inoculated people for this moment. Um, and so they really had highlighted that principle of universality and had really used that in their strategy. So internally, amongst their own base, they did a lot of study about what does universality mean, and it was clear to people that there were no circumstances under which they were going to stand for any be anyone being cut out of the bill. They also used that in all their communications and their media so that they were putting out a clear moral case around universality publicly. And they used that principle as well with, as they were building network power with their allies. And so their allies also showed up without a moment's hesitation. And they rallied thousands of people to the state house in a tremendous show of power. And the legislatures withdrew their amendment and it was defeated. So I want to close here um, to leave some time for Q&A. Um, you know, it, again, I think this is just like an extraordinary moment we're in, and things could go any direction. But I'm really hopeful, I think, about so much of what I see happening. And I'm really hopeful about how many people I see in this room from all over the state. Um, you know, I, some key questions for me is how can we continue to connect with people? Um, you know, people are, want action, they realize things aren't working, and, you know, how can we give legitimacy to what people are experiencing and feeling, and also give them a way to actually engage and do something about it? I think those are key questions. And something I've learned in seeing folks working all over the country is that nobody knows how to do all this stuff, right? We're all, we all know about how to organize, and we're all learning a lot, too. And so, I, you know, one of, I see one of the main things we have to do, and you know, this is part of my work, is to connect what we're all doing, right? So what you're learning in Ohio has lessons for people in Oregon and Washington, and what folks in New York are learning has lessons for people here. Um, so I'm excited. I'm going to be here through the day. I'm looking forward to question and answers right now, uh, but I'm looking to hearing more from you all and having a great conversation. Thank you. I'm Mike Dioro from Local 1112, UAW. I got a question on uh, coordinating the states, you say 2020, Oregon, Washington, and Vermont, and Ohio. Are they going to be uh, coordinating? Is somebody from each state coordinating everything together on the right track, going for the everything going procedure-wise, like from A, B, C? Uh, could you answer that? It might be kind of a hard question, you know, because we're talking different states and they're spread out from Oregon to, like, Vermont. No, I think that's a great question. So I would say that not on, like, the, you know, A, B, C level of detail, but there's some great networks. Um, one payer states is one network that, you know, I think Span Ohio has tapped into and that folks in these other states are as well. And uh, Healthcare Now is an organization that has its own chapters, but is a really great national connector of different um, work. And so I think that these networks, what they're doing is putting people in touch who are, you know, figuring out as we go along how can we coordinate. But I think that there's still questions of, of the how, like what we actually need to do. Yeah. And part of my feeling, too, is that, you know, there can't just be one point of connection between, say, Ohio and Oregon. We actually need more people, more members of SPAN need to be in touch with more members out there. Okay, thank you. Okay. And I can help with that answer? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um. Yeah, with the one-payer states and, the, um, and healthcare now, you know, SPAN has been very active participants in both of them, and, you know, we keep in touch with the people from, um, that are members of that, including, you know, Oregon and Washington and the states that are planning to move forward with, uh, with this, with ballot initiatives. We are very, very closely watching the Colorado situation because they will be on the ballot in November. We are watching to see what the campaign is against them. And so far, it's just on higher taxes. That's the biggest thing that they've come up with. And so we've always already started taking some moves to combat that. Um, and stuff. So yeah, there's you know those organizations and that collaboration that goes on through those organizations. You know, one payer states is a very loose one. There's no, um, 
no officers, no treasury, no nothing. <laughs> you know, it's just people that are working within the states to move this thing forward. And so that has been invaluable. We have gotten so much great information. I think the other thing too is that the single payer movement has gotten its act together and we have come together as um, a whole in our national conferences when we joined together because we had Physicians for a National Health Program, we had Health Care Now, we had One Payer States, and we had the labor campaign for single payer that all held a joint conference in Chicago last fall. And that shows some growth and maturity on our part that we're getting everybody under the same roof and hearing the same thing. And we're not worried about separate turf wars and who did what, we're worried about getting this program forward. I'm Don Rucknagel. I've been with SPAN about 12 years. Um, you haven't mentioned him yet, but uh, if you did, I didn't get it. Um, where do you see Bernie Sanders and his movement fitting into this scheme of things? That's a good question. I think he's brought a lot of much welcomed legitimacy to um, you know, for a long time, uh, universal health care, single payer, and I'd say, you know, democratic socialism at large, which was sort of painted as this, these fringe ideas, totally impossible. And I, my sense is that what he's been saying has really been resonating with millions and millions of people. And I think that's a big boost for all of us. So that the, in terms of just changing the debate, I think that's already helped. Um, there's a question, though, for me, and I don't have an answer to this, of what happens to the people who have been actively engaging his, in his campaign, right, who have been giving money, who have been showing up at rallies, where are they now and what's going to happen to all that energy, you know, and how do we connect with them? I think that's something we need to figure out. I spent my career on the dark side working in corporate employee benefits and health care, and so I've worked with a lot of insurance companies. And one of the things that I, I, I'm not quite sure I understand in, in this movement, I'm totally convinced through that work that we're on the right path here. Um, but the question I have is in terms of the dollars and cents, because I think many people won't be brought into this fold on, on simply the, the theory or the human rights aspect. They'll be brought into the fold because it makes sense to have a single payer system, and other countries um, do that. Is there a chart pack? Is there a place where data has been developed or source where there's better data that you are using that would be helpful in convincing other folks who are more numbers or data-based um, of, of the argument? Yeah, so there's a lot of organizations that have been doing this research. Um, one of the things, you know, we've been mostly focused on sort of the state level, and so we did a financing plan to, in, to contradict the governor's plan in Vermont to show actually that financing the healthcare system was totally possible. Um, so that's on our website, nesri.org, N-E-S-R-I.org. But also PNHP and a number of other groups have a lot of great research out there. Um, that really makes a, a unequivocal case in terms of dollars and cents. The Congressional Budget Office did it in the 1990s. The General Accountability Office did it in the 1990s. We've got about six different states that have done single payer analyses. And there's probably, in some of those states, more than one econometrics firm that has looked at it. Every single one of them says we can cover everybody. No out of pocket costs. Go to any doctor you want, any hospital you want, and we still save money. That's how much we waste. Yeah, PNHP would be a good resource there because if you go to the frequently asked questions on PNHP's website, physiciansfornationalhealthprogram.org, uh, and you go to the FAQs, you'll probably find a link to all that stuff. Okay, great, thank you. What was it you? And then I saw that here. Debbie mentioned, uh, it was a Senate Bill 137 in Ohio and I know uh, Senators Skindle and uh, Tavares are really community oriented. They're kind of a, a real minority in our strong Republican state house. But uh, uh, is, is this bill, uh, can you kind of give an idea as to how far it might go in the state house without a lot of people behind it? Is, is there anything that you understand about it? Nowhere. It'll go nowhere. Even with people behind it, it hasn't moved. Sorry, sorry. And, um, you know, 
The reason is we don't have enough people behind it to force it. Our legislators do not have a backbone and do what's right until we make them. And we have to be real forceful in the message that we give them and letting them know that this is what's expected of them. Um, when we take it in our own hands, they suddenly sit up and take notice. And the closer we get to the ballot initiative, it's like, oh my gosh, maybe we should do something. Because they would much rather do it than have us do it. Because they want their say in it and that. But I say, you know, at this point in time, they've had their chance. Now, there are some very good people that, you know, have come on as co-sponsors on that bill, and that's Senator Kenny Yuko and Senator um, Cecil Thomas. Um, but where are the rest of them? You know, Edna Brown is also a co-sponsor on this. Are we, am I missing one more? I think I might be. Um, you know, but where are the rest of them? And then when I go over to the House side, our sponsors there were term limited, but one of the co-sponsors that used to always co-sponsor it says, well, I'll co-sponsor it, but I'm not going to introduce it because that would ruin my credibility. And another one says, well, I, you know, I don't want to do that because I'm in a leadership position. Well, be a leader then. <laughs> You know, that's, that's my thing. In the state house, you know, unless we have a massive uprising and we really force their hands, they're not going to move. So we need to. Do you have a lobbying effort going in the state house? Yeah, we do. We do. We, we've been doing um, in-district lobbying with them. We've got uh, meetings set up and stuff like that. And, uh, and oh, they're with us in spirit. <laughs> the line I heard once I like is when we build the parade, they'll run to the front of it and grab us on. Yeah. <laughs> we need to build the parade. That's when I think that's best message here too. From what I'm hearing, you know, we need to build the parade. Who else here? My name is Lou Klein. I'm a physician member of Ohio Span. Although I've been supporting the network, I have concerns, and I think some of the people who are reluctant to get on board may have these concerns and are afraid to say so. It isn't just a simple issue that the funding is going to support health care. You have to look at how much this health care costs by breaking it down, or as they said in the movie, all the president's men follow the money. Whether it's pharmaceuticals, hospitals, or as a physician, how will I get paid? There's a lot of worry that will there be enough money to pay these bills, and of course the other industries have to play a part in solving the problem. How likely is the pharmaceutical industry wanting to play ball with the rest of us? So anything we can do to address this, the specifics have to be addressed for these changes to occur. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, we need to do our homework, we need to do our analysis, we need to be able to communicate those numbers very clearly. Um, but I don't think that just talking about numbers is going to build the political will that we need to actually make this happen. I think that we also have to communicate on an emotional level with people and to really build mass mobilization, large numbers of people. And I just don't think that most people are going to get out there in the streets because of a dollars and cents argument. So I think we have to do both. We have to make our case, be able to clearly, you know, say this is why this makes the most sense and here's the math to prove it. Um, but we also have to do sort of values-based organizing. Um, my name is Bob, I'm an economist and I happen to sit next to Costas who is also an Australian citizen. So, and he just told me, what, how, how is Australia's um, system funded? I mean, 2% two, two of the taxable income is paid to Medicare. Okay, from everybody's, 2% of everybody's, regardless, okay? Um, I happen to be able to talk to the two guys who wrote the 20-page paper that became single-payer in Australia. The way they sold it to the legislature was as a 7% solution. We are going to take 7% of the gross domestic product of Australia and make it for the health care of the people of Australia for no, everybody in. Now, all you politicians and all you well-paid doctors and all of you insurance people, then figure out how you're going to make a go of it at your 7 percent. It's the same amount we're spending right now. The U.S. government's spending 9 percent of the GDP right now. We could have a 9 percent solution. Make the politicians decide how they're going to spend the 9 percent. Make the doctor take a cut and pay and work differently. Make the hospital go from 57% uh, bad occupancy to 87% bad occupancy. 
it's simple. If there's a will and um, there's plenty of money, I think there's a way to do it. Comments, Ben? <laughs> Yeah, no, Can we I think learn I, from international experiences like this? I think so. But uh, Yeah, we, we have a lot to learn from other countries. And so I hadn't heard that from Australia. I think that's really helpful. And yeah, and I think we have to be really clever with our framing and how we present this. But there's, yeah, it's, and we also have to, there's the question of how we build the political will behind that. Because there's, as you're pointing out, there's going to be winners and losers and people are going to have to make concessions. And so how do we build, make this a political possibility? Well, the status quo is it goes up twice. Goes up, uh, healthcare goes up twice the um, mm -hmm. CPI each year. The health insurance companies get now guaranteed 15% off the top. The pie gets bigger, they make more money. Everybody's happy, right? <laughs> yeah, that's a, a good point. I, maybe I'll riff on that for one sec, privilege of the mic. But the insurance companies have no interest in controlling health care costs. They will say they do, but ultimately they get a percentage of whatever we spend. Why would they want us to spend less? You know, so, uh, you know, there's no question about that. And there, again, Bob's worked on pharmaceutical stuff overseas too, and the pharmaceutical companies know how to make money when they're negotiating with nations. You know? uh, all the pharmaceutical companies were interested in Australia when I was pricing Celebrex for Pfizer and Pharmacia, is how much money could they get from the people of Australia to pay for their drug, okay? We priced it at dollar three here and 39 cents in Australia. We made just as much off the people of Australia per capita as we do off the people of the U.S. because in Australia they go to the doctor more often and they, they get more prescriptions for Celebrex. You, you, pharmaceutical companies play the premium pricing game here because they can make the doctors and pay off the doctors prescribe their drugs, pure and simple. It's sleazy. <laughs> James, I went off on from uh, USW Local 979. How do we go about the argument, you know, where we're basically having hospitals pit, each other, pit against each other? In northern Ohio, you have the Cleveland Clinic and University Hospitals, the two big players, and then Metro's kind of the little brother on the side. In Brunswick, they built an emergency room for University Hospitals and turn around, so we're doing it because we want to stabilize the patients and move them on to wherever they want to go. Cleveland Clinic realized that they saw a 50% drop in the number of admissions in their Medina mm -hmm. Hospital because everybody was getting stabilized in Brunswick and moved to Southwest Hospital in Middleburg Heights. How do we fix that problem there? Because Cleveland Clinic turned around and says, we're building an emergency room in Brunswick too. <laughs> so you got two emergency rooms across the street from each other. Yeah. But then you don't have one in Hinckley. You don't have one in Valley City. So now you've still got the 40 minute ride to the hospital if you're in Valley City. Yeah. In Toledo, we have dueling helicopters. That one's going here. They've done everything but put machine guns on them, so. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. I mean, we have care overprescribed in some places and underprescribed in others. I mean, everything is totally out of whack. And so I think part of what we need to point out is the idiocy of the whole system. And the, and the ways people are concerned about the cost, you know, and so then you've got an unnecessary facility or an unnecessary, unnecessary helicopter service, helicopter ambulance service, and we all end up paying for it one way or the other. It all gets built into the infrastructure, and that all gets built into our health care costs. So, you know, we should drop smart bombs on ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things to keep in mind is um, health follows wealth. Wealthy people are healthier people. They live longer. We know that. Uh, but medicine follows money. One of the things that we saw in Canada when they adopted their universal plan was that those resources moved out into other underserved areas because there hadn't been money to pay for them before, there was now. And I think you know, that part of it will help to even that out a little bit. Um, the other thing is we really need to take a look at what we're doing with those resources because part of what has to happen and needs to be part of the legislation is that those resources have to be equitably distributed. Okay. 
Bob Lynn with Toledo Area Jobs with Justice, also with uh, uh, Plumbers and Pipe Fitters in Toledo, Ohio. Um, one of the things that uh, I think the progressive side always continues to get wrong is we want to sit down and explain everything to everybody. Uh, we have to be able to win the bumper sticker war, as I always like to say, when it comes to an issue. Because if you can't uh, get it said in 10 to 15 seconds, they have no idea and will not sit long enough to listen to the explanation. It's great that we can all come down here today and we can all sit around and be able to talk about this. But at the same time, I think we need to think strategically about what our message is. Uh, I know when they had some of the conversation before, health care now and all the rest of that stuff, uh, I think we need to think about, this is, this is my suggestion for a bumper sticker. It's called, I want to be a health care fan. And what's that mean? Health care fan is health care for all now. And it needs to be something where we all start to say that. Then when we get that opportunity to sit down and talk to people for that five or ten minutes, if they'll listen to what we've got to say, then we can have those immediate figures to be able to put out there. Then we can talk about equity. We can talk about making sure underserved communities all get done, etc. But if we don't start winning the the uh, bumper sticker war, like Black Lives Matter, Fight for 15, Occupy, those things are all things that people start to rally around. And until we start to do that, it just doesn't make any sense. And as much as I like single payer action network span, span doesn't mean anything. It needs to be something where you can go and say what you're standing for, short, concise, to be able to do it. I didn't want to say a lot, but I'll tell you one of the most energetic uh, and energized things that I've done recently is I was watching Wall Street Journal on Saturday morning while I was doing my paperwork, and a guy called in with the question from democracyspring.org, and they're a group of Occupy people. We're having a flash riot in Washington. We're going to have thousands of people there. We're all going to try to get arrested. Bingo. I'm in the car. I'm headed to Washington. <laughs> These are amazing people and a wonderful group to hook like your wagon onto. Democracy Awakening was there. They walked from Philadelphia to DC. Uh, I tried to give them shoes. I tried to give them food. I tried to get them hotel rooms. They refused. They said, we are doing this because we believe in it. And we're not taking, they say we're taking money. We're not taking money from anybody. And then I had to go back to work Monday, and I missed getting arrested with Ben and Jerry's ice cream values. <laughs> so anyway, this is a, a technique I saw that worked really well in keeping with your comment of let's keep it simple. Yeah. So we could do that same type of thing in Oregon and Washington. A lot of us have been thinking about if it would be useful to get arrested, useful to get arrested, that it would be worth doing. I'm ready for it, but I want to make sure that it will matter. Yeah, my question or comment is, I totally agree with the last two comments. We have to have a cutting edge, direct action plan. And at the same time, we need to have a universal slogan. I think health care for all or health care or human rights. I do think we have to talk about single payer. But my question, uh, it seems to me that one of the links that we need to draw is the day-to-day -day struggle for health care. Uh, we had a hospital closing. We have every day people are being denied health care. People are, are, are overpaying. Somehow we have to organically link the struggle and use that as a ramming tool to knock down the wall. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think that things like hospital closures are where people are very immediately feeling the denial of health care in their lives. And so those are really opportunities for us to connect with people and organize. So I think that's a great example. Thank you, everyone.